opportunity, and I thought it would be important to uh, revisit this subject once again. So if you would, turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. There's a particular story. There's many stories in the Bible about integrity, but we're going to look. The first one we'll look at is 2 Kings chapter 5. As you are, as you are turning, I want to ask just a few questions kind of as an open, a means of opening up or, or, or illustrating this theme. Um, when we think about integrity, how, how would we go about defining integrity? What is integrity? I've heard it said that, you know, that it's what you do when no one is looking. It's who you are when no one else is around. It's the material that you're made of. You know, it's the core of your being. If you kind of think about a tree, um, you think about like, uh, let's say, let's imagine a tree that looks good on the outside, but upon further inspection, you go over, you you see a little, you know, um, hole, and you see that inside the tree, it's all rotted away, and it's it's dead, it's dying. Uh, how might God, if he looked at our lives, how might he classify our life? Um, another illustration I think of is with the collapse of the bridge, 95, you know, up in, up in when was it, New Jersey or Pennsylvania? Yeah. Now, I don't think there was anything wrong with the engine. I don't think that was the engineer's fault per se, but you do hear of buildings and earthquakes collapsing. And you can't help but imagine, especially in other countries, that engineers or builders might cut corners and use materials of lesser quality in order to make an immediate profit. But in the end, you know, there's a short-term gain for a long-term cost. So you think about integrity regarding the structure of a building, the foundation of a building, or maybe even, you know, again, going back to the tree example, uh, thinking about how healthy a tree is, just because it looks good on the outside, doesn't mean it has strong integrity on the inside. So in our lives, integrity is, I believe, a core motivation um, that drives our decisions or our actions. It's kind of an internal operating system. And what I mean by that is I think there's really only two basic operating systems. There is either self-interest or the opposite of that would be God interest. God-centered, what, what is it that would please God? And the opposite of that, would what, what is it is my best interest? What is it for uh, that would benefit me personally? So integrity, in a sense, is displayed every time we make decisions, which we make a thousand decisions a day. You know, integrity is revealed in the decisions that we make. Um, because a decision always manifests from the core operating system of our heart. Either it's motivated by the lusts of the flesh, the material enjoyments of the world, self-interest, self-benefit, or it's motivated by a higher standard of obedience to God and a desire to walk in Christ-likeness. To, to basically, you know, you see those little bracelets sometimes, what would Jesus do? Either it's the what would Jesus do, what benefits God, or it's what benefits self what is in self's interest. And those two uh, operating systems basically determine every decision we make. Um, I mentioned this a year ago. It, there was a famous circumstance with some fishermen up north, walleye fishermen, where they were catching the fish. They were, they were consistently coming in first, second, or third in multiple tournaments even winning the tournaments. And for any fisherman, you know the consistency with fishing, especially in different bodies of water, is very difficult to do. So, uh, and the fish were weighing in heavier than one would expect. So uh, one of the you know, leaders at the weigh-ins had cut open the fish and found that the fishermen had been stuffing lead weights inside the fish's mouth, and they had been winning all, and you can imagine how many people were angry because the prize money that went along with that was, was fairly significant. And they had been basically stealing prize money from fishermen who had deserved it because of their lack of integrity. But you see in that, which operating system were they, you know, were they based upon self-interest? 
you know, material gain. Um, so basically, are we living to please God or are we living to please self? There's, there's no other core operating system besides those two. Okay, let's look at a biblical example. There are so many examples of integrity because integrity deals with choices. And we see many, many choices in Scripture, uh, and we can analyze the good and the bad. So in 2 Kings chapter 5, hopefully you guys have made your way there. I love the Old Testament. There's so many great things in the Old Testament. Jesus and the disciples only preached from the Old Testament. That's all they had. There's no, there's no difference in my mind. It's all one to me. It's just before the cross and after the cross, but I see the same principles, the same gospel, uh, the same teachings in both the Old and the New. All right, 2 Kings chapter 5. I'm going to skip the first 14 verses, but let me give you the context. There's a very powerful man. He's a general. He's the commander of all the armed forces of a neighboring country to Israel. But the one thing about his life is he has success He's, he's very wealthy. He just has leprosy. And he hears from a slave girl that there is a prophet in Israel who has supernatural power. So he says, why not? I'm going to go visit her, uh, him, sorry, and uh, maybe he'll cure me. So he goes to his king and he gets permission. He travels down to Israel and he eventually finds Elijah, the prophet. He comes to his house. And uh, he knocks on the door, and Elijah doesn't even come to the door. He just sends his servant, says, he tells Gehazi, he says, go to the man, go tell him, go down to the Jordan River, go in and out seven times of the Jordan River, wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh will be completely restored like a newborn baby's. And Naaman gets angry. I mean, this is a man of authority, of power. And he's angry that Elijah didn't come out himself and wave a, you know, and chant a special thing over him to heal him. Uh, but his servants say, hey, if he would have asked you to do something extensive, you would have probably done it. Why not do this simple thing? And let's just, let's just obey. Let's just go down to the Jordan, wash seven times, and see what happens. Can't hurt. So Naaman goes down, he washes seven times, and he is miraculously healed of his leprosy. And that's what we're going to pick up in verse 15. He's going to come back to the house of the man of God. Verse 15. Now Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept this gift from your servant. But the prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. All right, I just want to stop there for a moment. It is so rare to find a man of God or any leader, right, who refuses material gain, financial gain, as a result of their position or service or power, okay? In the history of the world, you think about it, I mean, you find, you, this is a rare ability, this is a rare characteristic, and I think it shows uh, Elijah's integrity that what he considered of greater value than wealth and money was to have that personal relationship with God and to operate as a prophet with a supernatural gifting. So no matter, even though he is urged to take us extensive gifts for his, uh, his act, um, he says, no, I don't want anything, and he sends them away in peace. Now go down to verse 19. Elijah, Elijah said, go, go in peace. After Naaman had traveled some distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to him, My master was too easy on Naaman, this foreigner, this Arminian, by not accepting from him what he had brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. Now, I skipped over the verses that, that told you how much he brought. Here's what he brought. He brought 750 pounds of silver. Okay, and 150 pounds of gold and some very nice expensive clothing. 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold. Now the silver, much less value, that would have equated to about $300,000 in today's money. But the gold, 150 pounds of gold, would have equated to a roughly shy of $5 million. So Elisha's being offered five, up to $5 million, if not more, dollars. And he says, keep your money. 
it's not, it's worthless to me. I don't, I don't need it. That's not what I value in life. Okay. Uh, but, but, but Gehazi is being tempted. Now think about the operating system of Gehazi versus Elijah. Gehazi, as we're going to see, is going to do something that violates godly integrity and instead operates out of self-interest. And the scary thing, and I've looked at every, I've looked at every one of these in the Bible. It's so scary. It's so scary. This is my main point. Is anytime you operate out of the operating system of, of self-interest, there are always consequences. Always. I have never found a single example where there wasn't consequences. They may not be immediate, but they will always occur because God always sees what we do. Anytime we operate out of the, uh, the system of pleasing him, there's always consequences too. He blesses us. He rewards. But every time, every time we operate out of self-interest, there's, it's a trap. It's a trap by the enemy. And we're going to see what the trap is here for Gehazi. And we're going to see the consequences that he suffers as a result of this failure. All right. So he says, my master was too easy. Uh, I will run after him and get something from him. So he doesn't tell Elisha. We can see there's a motivation is the lust of his flesh. He, he sees an opportunity to increase material wealth. All right. So Gehazi, verse 21, runs after Naaman. When Naaman saw him running toward him, he got down from his chariot and came to him and says, is everything okay? Everything is all right, verse 22, Gehazi answered. My master sent me, now that's a lie, so now it's going down deeper into this realm of sin. My master sent me to say, two young men from the company of the prophets have just come from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent, that's 75 pounds of silver and two sets of clothes. By all means, take two talents, so 150 pounds of silver, said Naaman. He urged Gehazi to accept them and then tied up the two talents of silver in bags and set them and two sets of clothing. And he gave them to two of his servants and they carried them ahead of Gehazi. When Gehazi came to the hill, he took, things, he took the things from the servants and put them away in the house, in his house. And he sent the men away and left. Um, if you kind of read that in the Hebrew, it's when he got close to his house, he said, okay, I'll take it from here, guys. You, you go ahead. You go back to your master. I'll take it from here. And he kind of secretly took the material possessions into his home so Elijah, his master, wouldn't see. All right? So now he's trying to hide. He's being deceptive. He's lied. He's, we see greed here. Um, then verse 25 says, he went and stood before his master and Elisha asked him, where have you been, Gehazi? And your servant didn't go anywhere, Gehazi answered. That's a lie. But Elisha said to him, was not my spirit with you when the man got down from the chariot to meet you? Is this the time for taking money or to accept clothes? or olive groves, or vineyards, or flocks, or herds, or male, or female slaves. And Naaman's leprosy will now cling to you and your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence, and his skin was leopardous. It had become as white as snow. So this is a very fearful thing. I don't even like preaching on this because I feel kind of convicted because... When we step out with self-interest, number one, God always sees. He always sees. And there are always consequences. It's a trap of the enemy. It's a lie. He lies to us to tempt us to do things in our own interest, knowing that there's going to be consequences that are going to follow suit. All right? So the danger is when we live less than God's best, when we violate his absolute principles of integrity or truth or holiness, you know, or character, it really is a trap of the enemy designed to harm us. And every violation of God's highest standard, every violation of God's highest will always brings consequences. You could say that compromise always costs. Compromise always costs. There's a danger to live less than God's best when we walk in the flesh, when we violate his principles. We can never break God's law without consequences. And if you think about the greatest law, like the Ten Commandments, 
Thou shalt have no other gods before me. God must be first. And when we disobey that law, when we violate that law by not putting him first at all times and in all things, there's always unintended consequences that result. And that's a scary thing. We take shortcuts, you know, we are, I mean, I'm tempted to, to ignore the rules, uh, to cheat or cut corners at work, you know, to steal, to take a bribe, um, to, to say one thing but live differently. I mean, there's so many ways that we are tempted to live less than God's best. And I was thinking about this and I was writing down some of the examples that we have in Scripture um, where people were, mo- they were motivated by greed or fear or jealousy or revenge or boosting their reputation. And in every circumstance, think about Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament church. They sold a piece of land for like $100,000. They held some of it back. They kept 20000 in their own pocket. They went to the disciples in the church and they said, hey, we sold a piece of land. We're going to give you all of it. And they gave the 80000 Not the hundred. They gave 80000 And Peter, by the supernatural revelation of the Spirit, said, you're lying to God and you've lied, you've lied to the church and you've lied to God. You kept back part of it. You could have just, why don't you just tell us the truth? And you know what God did in that circumstance in Acts chapter 5? He struck them down dead. And the fear of the Lord came on the whole church. So that's just one extreme example. Uh, He said, you have not lied to men, you've lied to God. And God, the consequences, the immediate consequences is they died there on the spot. So it is scary uh, when we think about the danger of a lack of integrity. Uh, A lack of integrity in your life could uh, lead to a loss of time or money. It, It could negatively affect your Christian testimony. It could strain or harm or destroy the relationships that you have with friends or family. It could erode your level of trust with others. The list is truly endless. Uh, I rem- I'm reminded of that one passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It says, No temptation has overtaken you beyond what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. So basically, with every choice, there's two doors. There's the door that Jesus always walked through, Okay, there's the door of of pleasing God in all things, of obedience to God. And then there's the door of self-interest, of what the of the flesh. And we are given a choice in every single uh, decision of our lives. You know, every choice is a door is a choice between those two doors. Um, And Jesus had many opportunities to lower his level of integrity, but he always chose the door that brought honor and glory and obedience to to the Lord. He always took the door that that pleased God. Um, The other danger with integrity, we're going to look at another example here in a a moment. The other danger is it's easy to rationalize doing the wrong thing. I mean, human beings can rationalize pretty much anything. Uh, And what I mean by that is basically uh, coming up with good reasons for selfish actions, you know, or applying a good purpose to something that is inherently wrong. Basically, some of us, I've thought about this, I've done things that I, you know, and it's like, I'm I'm never going to get caught, you know? Um, Or there won't be any consequences, or no one will ever know. But all of those are lies. It's lies from the enemy as a trap. A satanic lie is a trap because nothing escapes the notice of our creator. And as I went, I'm not just saying this because from personal experience, I have looked at, Dozens and dozens of of, um, individuals' lives and circumstances in the Bible, and I've arrived at the conclusion that every time, every action has consequences. Every decision we make, there's always consequences for not choosing God's highest path, the highest path of of Christ-like integrity. All right? All right, let's let's take a look at another one. This time, we'll look at a positive example. And this would be in the life of Joseph in Genesis chapter 39. Very famous example, but we'll take a look at it again. I was thinking about David because we got baby number, boy number four on the way, and we decided um, since we have an Abishai, an A, a Beniah, a B, a Caleb, a C, we need a D name. There's not that many. David, Daniel. Um, so we were kind of thinking uh, David Uriah which is a combination of um, David and the king, and then, unfortunately, one of his generals, Uriah, 
who he killed in order to get um, Bathsheba. Yeah. So, but Uriah was a man of integrity, and he was a mighty. He was a mighty man of God. Abishai was one of the one of the head generals for King David. Benaiah was a mighty man of God, one of the head generals for King David. Uriah was a mighty man of God, one of the head generals for David. Um, and Caleb, of course, was uh, was a mighty man of God, just under Moses. You know, so um, I don't know if Uriah is a giant killer. Oh, David. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. They're all giant killers. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> missed that one. They are all giant killers. They all killed. Yeah, that's awesome. All right. My wife is so amazing. She's just smart. Thanks for, thanks for correcting me in front of everyone. That was wonderful. You're right. All right. Yeah. All right, we make a good team. Genesis chapter 39, let's look at this positive example. So, Joseph, of no fault really of his own, maybe a lack of wisdom in sharing his dream with his brothers, is uh, out of jealousy, they, they sell him into slavery, he goes down to Egypt. And in verse 1, it says, he's been taken down to Egypt, Potiphar, an Egyptian, who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, uh, bought him from the Ishmaelites, who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Stop right there. This is a side point, but that is really my heart's cry. I, I, I pray, I, I really, my heart's desire is that God would so fill individual believers that the world would recognize that God lives in us. And they would be so attracted to that. And they would, you know, just like this, his master realized that God was with him and the Lord would give us success in all things because, as you're going to see, Joseph was a man of integrity. A man of integrity. And God always blesses men or women of integrity who seek to put God first, to obey God, and to honor God with their decisions. All right? Verse 4, Joseph found favor in the eyes of his, uh, and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he, now what does your version say? Entrusted, okay? That's the issue of trust. So integrity always fosters trust, always. If you have a high level of integrity, people can trust you. If you have a low level of integrity, it's, hard, it's difficult for people to trust. Trust and integrity go hand in hand. So because Joseph is a man of integrity, he's entrusted with everything in his care. Everything that Potiphar owned, he put into Joseph's care. Verse 5, from the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had to Joseph's care with Joseph in charge. He did not concern him with anything except the food he ate. All right. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. Now I have a personal theory on this. I don't think it was just because Joseph was probably in his early twenties. You know, he was probably well built and handsome. Uh, if he had that kind of status in Potiphar's house, he probably was wearing nice clothes. Uh, he probably ate good food. Um, but I think one of the things, like talking just to Kristen and I, and we have other, one of the things that's very attractive is a godly man. You know, a godly person is character. Character is very attractive. Integrity is very attractive. And we see that his master's wife was not a woman of integrity. All right. So not only, I think for somebody, sometimes it's attractive for those who are godless to try to bring down the godly. And even if that wasn't the case, and I don't know if it was just a motivation by pure external flesh, you know, really what he looked like, or if it really was Satan inciting her to try to bring him down, or maybe she genuinely was attracted to him because he was a man of, of integrity of character, but she basically tempts him 
uh, to, to come to bed with her. All right, verse 8. But he refused. He said, with me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with, with anything in the house. Everything he owns has been entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. And then he says something very, very important. We see in the next sentence what operating system Joseph is, is using. What is the core operating system of his life? He says, how could I do this wicked thing and sin against God? So his operating system was not what, what is in my self-interest and what would benefit me. It was what he feared God and wanted to live a life that honored God. It wasn't self-interest. It was God-interest. All right. So he, said, he, he declined. And over and over again, she made advances. Over and over again, he declined. Uh, if we keep reading, she basically um, makes an advance once when he's alone and he flees by ripping off his outer garment, his coat, you know, and he runs out of the house. And she holds that in her hands. And now in her frustration, she cries out and says that Joseph tried to rape her. All right. And uh, the master comes home. Let's see. We'll pick up in uh, verse 18. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his masters heard the story, his wife told him, saying, this is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. Now, it is true. If we are going to live for God in this life, okay, and we choose, we choose God interest over self-interest, we may suffer a temporary setback. That is certainly true. We find that in Scripture, okay? But the long-term blessing, the long-term gain is far superior than whatever Satan deceitfully tries to dangle in front of us here in this, in this realm, okay? Jesus is able to give us a hundred times more if we would choose God's path than if we would give in to temptation and choose Satan's deceitful, you know, here in this, in this life. So he suffers a temporary setback, but you know what? God is still with him. I'll read a couple more verses. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. All right, so Joseph chose to walk by faith and to believe that God could bless him later on down the road and to do the right thing to please God rather than short-term, worldly, material, material gain. And as a result, you know the ending of the story. What happens to Joseph? He becomes the second most powerful man, maybe in, in the world at that time, under Pharaoh, as God raises him up in, in due time. Now, um, just thinking about kind of <clears throat> I mean, I could go on and on with examples. And I did have David on my heart to share uh, some examples from David's life. But let me see if I can kind of work into some application for us. Uh, and then maybe I'll mention one or two examples from David's life as we go. All right, so application. Let's, let's bring this to, we'll circle the wagons. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering how powerful and alive is my self-interest? Thinking about our own operating systems, how, uh, how powerful and alive is our own flesh, how, our own self-interest? In what area do you feel that your flesh is more susceptible to putting its interests before God? That is a temptation for every single one of us, and in every one of our lives, it looks a little bit different. What I struggle with is not necessarily what you struggle with, and what you struggle with is not necessarily what I struggle with. But I'm just thinking about all the areas of my life. Are there any areas that lack integrity? Now, I'll tell you this. I don't like saying this, but I'll admit it. And I hopefully have redeemed my ways permanently from this point forward. I have always been a saver, like a saver of money. I just always wanted to save. I get pleasure out of saving. I don't like spending. 
That's changed since I've become married and have a big family. But, but I've always been susceptible to the temptation to cut corners in order to save money. Okay, that's just me. One of the ways I've cut corners in the past is by not buying a fishing license. Okay? Now you think that's just funny, but look, listen. Every little thing has consequences, right? Because God sees everything. So there is, when I was younger, especially, you know, um, or, you know, if I was going to go fishing in, in another state or something just once, I'm like, why would I buy a license for it? I can save the, it's only like $18, you know? But what's $18? Is $18 the worth losing your integrity over, you know? But for me, my prioritization was saving money, was just saving that money, getting a good deal. That's what it was, getting a good deal. And I, I, I relish the joy of like, I don't know. I just, I don't know what it was. That's just my thing growing up. So um, I remember, this, is, this was a scary thing, but I, I never had any major things getting caught. Thank God on that. But I did, like uh, two years ago, I remember taking the boys fishing and I bought a sportsman's license, which covers everything. And we were out there with, uh, I think it was Benaya and Abishai and a friend of mine. And we were fishing in the mountains of Virginia. And sure enough, the game wardens came and they was checking everyone. And um, they came over. You know, it's always afraid because you're like, did I get a license? Did I not get a license? Oh my gosh, you know, did you just... And... Um, I didn't, I, I didn't, I didn't have it. I didn't print it off and put it in my, so I had to give them my name and number. They called it in and they said, you're good. But in between of like, I don't have it on. And they're like, oh gosh, we got one of them. We got one. I'm like, oh. And it was kind of a scary moment there, but it was a lesson learned that I was safe. You know, I had, but, but um, gosh, at any moment, God, he sees the decisions we make, you know? And he does. He protects us. He has protected me from many things where I have violated integrity. And yet, let's say just drinking underage. That's one. That's a big one, right? That can be a big one for, for many high school kids. Um, so when we violate integrity, God is good. He, he, he can extend mercy and grace. But sometimes what I have found in my life um, is like if I take advantage of my employer's time or if I steal something from work, Little things, you know, it wasn't that big of a deal. But then little things can get into bigger things, can get into bigger things. Can, and before you know it, you got this pattern going on. And now you get so far down the road that it's, it's, it's compounding. It's getting worse. And God, sometimes I think he allows us to get caught because if he didn't and we kept on that path, we would destroy our lives. And I, I really am convinced of that. Never, You would never learn your lesson, right? Right. So God can extend mercy, but when he speaks to your conscience, when the Holy Spirit says, uh -uh, you're doing something you're not supposed to, stop it, turn around, don't, you know, whatever. We, we've got to listen. And God is only so patient that out of his love, he's going to have to bring consequences if we don't wake up, if we don't wake up. All right. Uh, the other thing I was thinking as we think about applications, I'm really trying to speak to your heart. Could a lack of integrity be hindering God's blessing in your life? Now think about that for a moment. If integrity is really the foundation, it's the operating system, and a violation of integrity, if we choose self-interest, it always comes with negative consequences. Maybe God can't bless you. Maybe he can't give you more. Whatever that is, position, power, money, whatever, you know, ministry. Maybe he can't give you more because your foundation is not strong. And if he did, your building would collapse. That's pretty scary. I'm praying, God, you know, give me more. Give me more fruit. Give and he's like, your branches can't handle more fruit. Your tree trunk is not strong enough to... So that's kind of convicting. And in our, you know, in our lives, I don't think it's money that corrupts. Money and power just reveal corruption that's already existed in the human heart, right? Um, what if... What if a lack of integrity in our lives is hindering God giving us more responsibility, more whatever, position, advancement at work, whatever it may be, just because we don't have the character that we need to be able to handle that? Um, all right, so last, last thing, three things. What are some ways we can build and maintain integrity? Three things. 
some ways we can build and maintain integrity. Number one, make a commitment to please God alone and obey the Bible as your highest motivation. That's got to be our operating system. Please God, obey the Bible. We've got to believe that God can reward us far greater than any little trinket that the devil tries to tempt us with in this life. We need to, and I, my operating system is still not fully functioning completely in that realm, but I need to believe in faith that God can reward. He will reward, and that my highest pleasure is in pleasing my Father, my Heavenly Father, not in attaining or amassing things in self's interest. Okay? Um, then the other thing is, next thing, number two, listen to your conscience and listen to the Holy Spirit. Both of them should point you in the right direction. Conscience and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit speaking to us. We've got to listen. We've got to obey. He's going to tell us between what's God's path and what is Satan's lie. And number three is keep in mind that God sees everything and that all actions have consequences. We are going to be held accountable for the way we live. And you think about David and Bathsheba. Um, David standing out on his porch one evening. He's supposed to be in the field with his army, but he's not. So that's a violation of integrity right there because he's not leading his troops. He's at home. He looks out. He sees a woman bathing. I guess he maybe had the high part of the city, you know, and he sees a woman bathing. Um, and he asks his attendant, says, go find out who is that woman. I don't know. Go find out who she is. That's Bathsheba, Uriah's wife. Uriah was one of David's 30 mighty men. He was one of his top 30 commanders, okay? And he says, bring her. Uriah is out in the field, bring her. So the servants knew, David knew, I don't, I don't know, I, I don't want to speculate on Bathsheba, but I don't think there was much she could do when the king, when, you know, I think, I don't think there was much she could do. So um, he commits adultery and she sends word three months later that I'm pregnant. And then David, this spirals into David saying, oh my gosh, I got to get Uriah back from the field. Bring, so he sends a message, bring Uriah back under the pretense of finding out, you know, how's it going out there? And he says, okay, oh, thanks for filling me in. Okay, the army's doing well. We're going to take the city soon. Okay, good. Why don't you go home and spend time with your wife before I send you back? But Uriah was such a man of integrity. He said, my soldiers are out in the field. They don't get to spend time with their wives. I'm not going home. And he slept on the porch. He slept with the servants out and he wouldn't go home to see his wife because he was such a man of integrity. And because he did that three days consistent, on the third day, David had to write a note for, the, for um, Joab, his commander, and he gave it to Uriah. He said, Uriah, give this to Joab. And you know what was in the letter? The, in the letter was his death warrant. And, and, and here's the cool, Uriah was such a man of integrity, he never peaked. Had he peaked, he could have probably saved his life. But he was such a man of integrity, he never opened the letter that he was carrying that was his death warrant that would put him in a dangerous situation in the upcoming battle so that he would be killed by the enemy archers. But through all of this, God saw what David had done, right? God saw it, and there were consequences. You know what the consequences were in David's life? Number one, his son died. And number two, God said, from this point forward, for the rest of your kingdom, you will never fail to have conflict in your kingdom. For the rest. It cost him greatly, greatly. So that's scary. I'm just sharing with you what I am struggling with as well. What are the areas in our life where we lack integrity? David, on the other hand, was a man of integrity at times too, because remember, he had the opportunity, to, uh, he was in the cave and King Saul was hunting him with his soldiers, and David and his men were far back in the cave, and they didn't know it. And Saul said, well, I need to go relieve myself, and uh, I'll go find a private place up in that cave. So Saul walks up there by himself, and I think he's probably, I don't know, I'm assuming number two, maybe. He's in the cave for a while, and David creeps up and cuts a little piece of his cloak off. How he was able to do that, I have no idea. But, you know, may, yeah, he may have taken it off, right? Hung it on this rock over here. He's trying to, you know, and David creeps up and cuts a little piece off because the men said, all his men said, go kill him. This is your chance. 
God's given you in his, God's given him in your hands. Kill him and you'll be the king. And David said, I can't do that. I can't operate out of self-interest. Let, let's put it in God's hands. Let God determine when it is right for me to become king. And David only cut a little piece of his cloak off and backed away and later told him when he left, said, Saul, I could have killed you, but I didn't because I recognize that you're the Lord's anointed. Let God do it in his timing. All right? So we see good and bad in the lives of, of, the, of the saints who have gone before us. What type of integrity do we have? Where are we struggling? Where are we susceptible by the lies of the enemy? Recognize that there always is consequences. We all need to grow in this area, not just men for Father's Day, but this is my heart's prayer. I need prayer for this. I'm sure you need prayer for this. We want to please God in every area of our life. And if we'll do that, final verse, final thing I'll say. Here's Psalm 8411. Psalm 8411. No good thing will God withhold from those whose walk is blameless. That's the promise. No good thing will God withhold from those whose walk is blameless. From a man or a woman of integrity, God will withhold no good thing. He can trust you. God can trust you with everything because you seek to please him in all things. That's the type of person I want to be. All right? Now, uh, with that said, I did download, Carolyn, I did download a um, that, that video, so I might just play it because it goes really well, and we'll close on that note. Um, so I think I played this before, but it's, it is really a good video and, um, where would it be? Okay. Let's see.